We would love to hear, for starters, you to talk a little bit about the success you're most proud of as a leader. I would say, you know, taking a, a roster uh, when I inherited the team in 2002 and, and turning the entire roster over and getting back to the playoffs in 2005, not the logistical accomplishment of turning over 25 players, but of having to lead a bunch of uh, a group of an organization, uh, having to communicate that externally to a public uh, with a lot of skepticism and doubt out there. Uh, but finding an internal group of people who bought into a vision, who aligned behind it, uh, who were bound together by a, a strong set of beliefs and values um, of what we could accomplish and not being overcome by some of the objective challenges along the way. And so seeing that manifest itself into a Central Division championship, knocking the Yankees out of the playoffs, I'm not sure anything could feel, tan you have a, tan a better tangible, more tangible feeling of that, that satisfaction, that fulfillment. Mark, let me ask about the many decisions you've made over the years, hundreds of decisions on players and all kinds of other related issues. Looking back on your 20 plus years now at the Indians, what's been one of your tougher decisions? And looking back on that, what would you have done differently with the benefit of hindsight on that? So I have my leadership moment, you okay, know, very uh, good. to reference you that I thought back and I had read your book and um, I, I inherited the team at a, at a juncture that I knew was difficult. Uh, because I knew the roster was aging, I knew we had some market correction, but the, the magnitude of difficulty was far greater than any of us internally knew strategically. Um, and I was staring in a decision in the face to trade our best player, a guy named Bartolo Colon, uh, a well-known pitcher, um, for three minor leaguers. So externally, three people that would be completely unknown. Um, as a leader, I knew I'd be disappointing pretty much every contingency out there. You know, our fans, our market, uh, the people in the office that worked that weren't tied to the baseball decision making, the field staff, you know, that led our team on the field and our players. Every constituency I had would be disappointed and they wouldn't understand the decision. Yet it was clearly intellectually and strategically the right decision. Um, and it was in my mind, and this is what I communicated to ownership who ultimately approved the decision, it was the only opportunity we had to chart a course, a true plan or strategy back to contention from where we were. Um, so we basically, the decision was let it naturally play out and make it understood by everyone what we had to do or preempt that decline with a very difficult to understand tough decision. And I'm curious actually just to follow up on that. So I think one of the unique things about that approach is being willing to make a short-term sacrifice for a long-term gain. We would love to hear a little bit more about your unique approach to leadership. Is there a situation that stands out similar to that where you led in a way that perhaps might differentiate you from other leaders? Um, I'm not sure the one situation stands out and I, I never give much thought to trying to differentiate myself. I think what I would try to do is, uh, and, the old, and the older I get and the more examples I have, the more I grasp towards that idea that the only way to sustain leadership is, is to, to be authentic. And the only way to be authentic is to have your leadership align with your values. Otherwise, you keep trying to determine how I should act in certain situations. And there's no way to replicate that from situation to situation. So I think, if anything, um, what may differentiate me or may make me similar to other effective leaders that can sustain it is that there's got to be some code. There's got to be some, you've, you've got to have gone through the effort. And it's not always an easy effort, it's sometimes a painful effort to be aware of the things that are important to you. And you've got to articulate those things to the people around you. And ultimately, what people buy into when they follow you, uh, when they join you, is they, they buy into those values. They buy into that, that sense of vision, of where that, that articulation of your vision of where you're going. They don't, in baseball, they don't buy into the uniform. They're not buying into the hat. You know, they're buying into the people behind that. Mark, going back to your college days, my guess is you had not openly or explicitly planned to become the president of a major league <laughs> baseball Certainly team, true, but, yeah. but here you are. And thinking about uh, the time since your college days to now, was there a, a, a turning point, an experience? Was there a mentor that really had an impact, or all three of those that had a major impact on who you are now? Yeah, I had two mentors that had an impact. Um, no one defining moment, but I think uh, I, can, I can maybe a defining uh, path. So the mentors were clearly my father, 
um, from a standpoint of uh, those values. You know, just watching the way he interacted with people, never qualifying people. You know, my dad in a small town of Baltimore, Maryland, would walk down the street and in an almost mayoral sense, knew everyone. Uh, the way he talked to the, you know, the guy who parked the car was the identical way he did talk to the mayor. And there was never a qualification, and every human being was equally as important to him. Um, that sense of, you know, importance, compassion, you know, was always a core part of who I am. Um, that sense of that values are intertwined. Uh, and I think this is kind of going back to the authenticity. You can't be one person as a father, brother, friend, husband, and a different person as a leader. You don't walk through the building and become president of a company. You know, it's not a cape you put on. You walk through the building, and you're the same guy you were, and how you treated your wife, your kids, your brother. Imperfect, certainly, but you, you have to be the same person. So my dad, I think, did that for me. John Hart, um, you know, was the general manager when I came on as an entry level, no titled cubicle dweller. Um, he saw something in me, along with Dan O'Dowd, who was the assistant GM at that time, that empowered me. Um, that when I look back and think what they were, how much they empowered me as a 24-year-old kid uh, with relatively little experience, um, I'm amazed. It didn't, you know, it was not amazing to me then, um, but it wasn't just giving me opportunity to lead. It wasn't just giving me uh, an area to be accountable and responsible for. It was them telling me, you know, hey, you're you're good. You know, you're a guy. You know, believe in what you're, you know, what you're saying. Your ideas are good ideas. Now, go execute them. So, how about a turning point experience? A, a moment, a decision, an inflection point. I don't. I don't know if I have one experience that that uh, I can think of. I mean, I, I think what led to me ultimately maybe having more opportunities in addition to gaining them their belief was being immersed in competitive environments like, you know, like this one, like Wharton, like Princeton, like the high school I went to, being around people that uh, subconsciously had high standards uh, for themselves that pulled me up to their level. So I'm not sure uh, that I was destined to do anything. I'm not sure that I, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room now and never have been, uh, but I know I'm a competitive guy. I know that for sure, and I know if you drop me into a room of a lot of really smart people that I'm going to try to figure out a way to rise to their level and at least hang with them. And if you do that enough, what you find is you keep asking that of yourself, you demand that level of excellence from yourself. And so I think not being one situation or one moment, it's, it was the convergence of that opportunity and those people that believed in me with that approach that you know, I demand a lot of myself. So that, you know, my thought coming in at 23 years old, 24 years old was, you know, this was a very simple way to approach it. Every single thing they give me to do, I'm going to do better and faster than they expect. That was, I mean, that's as simple as it was. It's all I ever said. You know, I'm going to do it better and faster. I started there. And what happens is the opportunity just kind of built off that. Great. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious then, if you think about those two decades that you spent with the Indians, how has your view of effective leadership changed over time? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think the maturity side of things, like I said, not to be redundant, it's more shifted more towards the authenticity side that I may have, as I came in, been more drawn to and thought more about the inspirational leader. So thought about the great speech, thought about the singular moment, um, and, I, and I th the great idea, um, and not the discipline, not the consistency, not the, you know, uh, continual effort, not the clarity of values, the things that lead to sustaining it. So I think as I, as I have matured, uh, the areas that interest me are that. And then probably uh, how do you lead, because this is very situational specific for me, how do you lead when you, the objective intellectual side of you understands so clearly that the magnitude of your challenges are so great, but you still have to take you still have to lead people to overcome those challenges. So I've got to kind of split, you know, understanding how the cards are stacked against us in our current situation. Um, and you've got to design your strategy based around that. So you better have a strong intellectual and objective understanding of that. But at the same time, you do still have to lead an, a very diverse group of people to overcome those challenges. And so you have to be positive. You have to be strong. And how do you do that? that that's probably the one that at this moment in time, um, as in my progression, that's the one that I wrestle with the most now and, and you know, try to, try to come up with strategies to personally deal with. 
Mark, when people come into positions of responsibility like your own, you almost always arrive with a number of preconceptions of what it's going to take to lead well. What turns out to be a preconception that didn't pan out, didn't turn out to be true? Ooh. Probably that you need to be strong, that you need to, uh, and by strong I mean almost intimidating, um, that you need, that, that fear is even plays any role in leadership, that, uh, that effort spent trying to act like a leader or, you know, becomes unauthentic, it becomes artificial, it becomes something that people see through pretty quickly. Um, so I think, you know, my earlier visions of leadership, um, perceptions of leadership might have been more built on some youthful understanding that it's hierarchical, um, that, you know, that it's superior, that there's some elevated stance. And, you know, the further I go, the more I understand that, you know, the humility is that is just such an important part. And so I don't think I ever really understood um, that, that I do think I heard a, a, of another leader talking recently about the scale of humility and confidence. And I, I am fascinated by, you know, being on that spectrum of humility and confidence because do, I do think to effectively lead, you can't be all the way to the humility side because then you really don't earn anyone's respect. But you can't be too far on that confidence side because then you lose all the respect. So there is somewhere in that spectrum where uh, I just think it has to be genuine self-confidence. It can't be fabricated or artificial. Thanks. Yeah, it's really interesting. It reminds me of, um, of a very old idea from Aristotle that you always wanted to be in, in the mean or the midpoint between humility and arrogance. Okay, well, that's maybe where that, that person was speaking from. But yeah, I, I kind of just looked at it like there's that spectrum. And a lot of times when I'm sizing up, you know, potential leaders in the organization in my own mind, you know, I'm, I find myself, he articulated or Aristotle articulated, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about those things. So how do you strike a, a balance? I think that you know, when, when people are arriving in major leadership positions for the first time, you know, they often end up sort of falling off the spectrum at one end or the other. Right. And you're talking about sort of being in this, this critical yeah. middle, middle range. How do you well, get there? Well, humility is very easy to come by in my field. <laughs> All you have to do is pick up a newspaper or turn on the radio and you can be humbled very quickly. Um, so I would just say aware, you know, that self-awareness is the key to having that balance. Um, it's something that uh, I think about all the time that we talk about internally uh, that I think effective leaders have to be before anything else. If you look at, you know, kind of building um, the foundation of what it takes to be an effective leader, that starts with that self-awareness. You've got to be aware of your strengths, but you've got to be keenly aware of your limitations. And you've got to be aware of your insecurities. Every single one of us has insecurities. Every person has them. People that manage their insecurities prevent them from derailing them. To me, almost every single time I see someone derailed in an effort to lead, insecurities are at the root of that, of being derailed. And so, again, we all have them, every single one of us, but they're easily managed if you take the time to be aware of them and then you talk yourself through them and ensure they don't derail your efforts. Mark, I've got a final question for you here. As you bring people into the ball club and mentor them, coach them, develop their leadership, what's the maybe the most important line of advice you would have for them. And to broaden that out a bit, speaking to undergraduate students back at your alma mater, talking with MBA right. students here, what general advice would you have for people who do want to take responsibility for not necessarily a ball club, but working for a, 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 an organization? So what, what's your advice? So the first thing I would say is to, to do the work, to take the time, to get to know themselves, um, to you can call it whatever you want. You know, you can call it, you know, to understand what values are important to you. To me, it's defining the things that, you know, going back and searching for when they're in the cultures, when they're in the environments that they're happiest and most fulfilled, why is that? And when there's a dissonance, when they're not happy, when they're finding that something's not correct, you know, what are the things that are not present? Because I think if they really do the work, and it's not easy work, but if they take the time to to establish, understand, and identify, and, and have a clarity to their value system, that they'll be surprised how many more things are out there that are opportunities to lead. That allows them to align themselves with the right leader and the right culture. And I think that path to development is going to come from being aligned with the right leader and in the right culture. The right culture and the right leaders are going to be obsessed with development. We obsess about developing our people. If you're in the wrong culture and, and you're not aligned, then ultimately you're going to be you know you're going to be asked to execute a, a task or a role, and there's not going to be much concern about your development. And I think 
you know, to me personally, I think that's what I'd say is do the work to, to really identify the things that are important to you. You'll be amazed. Open your mind up to the number of people you could be, you could learn from and work with that you're aligned with. And uh, it all starts there. It's great. Mark, we thank you for joining Knowledge of Wharton today. Thank you very to much. You guys. Thanks. Thank you.